praise your name, Lord. Thank you, Father, for sending your Son so that we can live, we can be free to worship him. Hallelujah.
year I'm believing God for miracles. I'm believing Him for miracles. But how do miracles happen is the question. How do we position ourselves for miracles? If you really would like to answer how it works, we're not going there this morning for sake of time, and it's not my subject, but Galatians 3, 1 through 9, tell us exactly how this works. It tells us that miracles happen by faith. In other words, you believe God for it. You stand for it. We stand for it as a church. You stand for it individually. How many of you have something in your life you're standing for to change? Amen. It might be a family situation. It might be a financial situation. It may be a work-related situation. It may be an extended, extended family situation. Could be a physical something in your body you need to see change this year. God is a God of miracles, and He gives us keys to those miracles. They happen by faith. So it seems important for us to talk about that for a moment. Faith works by love, Galatians 5, 6 tells us. So today I want to start off the new year talking about how faith works. Faith works by love. I want everybody to say that out loud. Faith works by love. That's what I've titled my message today, Love 2016. Notice this. Whatever we are believing God for will only happen to the measure we walk in love. We will see today that this love which works by faith means we love God and we love people. I want you to say out loud, I am to love God and I'm to love others. I believe this is the true secret and sometimes the part of it that we miss walking in and hinders us from other things God wants to do for us. I always look for a theme to come up in my heart to begin the new year. Last year was Matthew 6, Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. We sometimes want things, but there's something that precedes things is seeking God. Can you say amen? So if we're going to walk in the ways of God, we have to function the way His Word tells us. So if we're wanting to see miracles and they work by faith and faith works by love, then we need to find out as much as we can about walking in love. Let's start with a conversation Jesus had with the religious scholars of His day in Matthew 22. So if you're going to be looking on the screen grade, if you have a Bible in your lap, then open it to Matthew 22 and begin noticing here at verse 34. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first, I want everybody to say the first. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now notice particularly verse 40. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Since all the law and the prophets hang on these principles... It seems to me that loving God and loving people should be our focus to start out this new year. Now, sometimes you want to hear what's going to happen in 2016. I don't know what's going to happen. I think we're going to see more dark clouds. I know it gets quiet. I, I think things are getting worse in the world. And the Bible says when these things begin to happen, then lift up your heads and rejoice for your redemption draws near. Hallelujah. We shouldn't get nervous about what's going on in the world. We should get excited. Not wanting it to happen to the world, but excited that we get to go see Jesus. How many of you are looking for Jesus to come back? The angel said, the same Jesus you've seen go away will come again just as you've seen him go. He left in a cloud. He's coming in a cloud. Praise the Lord. And that cloud represents his glory. He left with the glory of the Lord, and he's coming with the glory of the Lord. So, yes, we're going to see some things happen in the world, particularly probably in America. 
We don't know that. We don't, we, can't, we don't have a crystal ball that we can see. We just have the Spirit of God, which is more accurate than anything we can have. And there is this sense that in the world, things are going to go worse and worse. But for the church, they're going to get better and better. Because a true distinction is coming between the world and the church. A lot of times through the decades, we blended the church together so much with the world, you couldn't tell the difference. But in the days ahead, to be a Christian, and we're already seeing it. We're already seeing on all the newscasts and all the things that there there is definitely a prejudice against the church, a prejudice against Christians. But you know what? Every time that has been the case, it united the church. It brought the church together. I want to see the day the Methodists and the Baptists and the Presbyterians and the Word people and all any, any group you could name that we come together as one because if the church ever becomes one, the world will have the answer to all their dilemma. Can you say amen? Say out loud, I believe that. You see, we're for the whole body of Christ, every bit of it. Oh, I may have a view different here or a view different there, and they the same, but that doesn't stop the one central thing that if you're a true Christian, you believe that the only way I can come to the Father is through the Son. There is no other name given among men whereby we might be saved but by the name of Jesus. Everybody who's teaching an all-inclusive doctrine, and we ever haven't, we even have some churches doing that, even those, even though that's going on, let me tell you something. Jesus made it very clear there is no other way but but him. Through Jesus, the world will be saved. Can you say amen? He came to save the world from their sins. On Christmas Eve, I had Jesus being born in America. I'm going to tell you at the end of the service why I misspoke. I really got quiet. Well, I corrected it in the middle of saying it. I said he was born for America and the whole world, but my first statement was Jesus was born in America. Josh reached over to his mother. He said, I didn't know Jesus was a U.S. citizen. (laughs) But there's a reason that I so misspoke. I'll tell you the story later. Now, hear the rest of my message, not waiting for the story. It's going to be later in the day. Notice this, how the message brings out about love. He said, love the Lord your God with all your passion." You see, that's what I mean by fervency, is passion. When we come to church, we're not coming on our own agenda. We're to come with passion towards God. Let him do whatever he wants to do. I don't try to tell the Lord what to do in a service. I try to follow what he wants to do in a service. And sometimes he just wants to come and bring you a great word. Sometimes he wants to come and move especially by his spirit and his spirit only. More often than that is the combination of the two, the Spirit of God working and we're working right beside him. Can you say amen? Amen. And so it's a beautiful thing when we come together as believers and we recognize that we can't do this with our own talent. I don't care how much talent you've got on this stage. If they're not prepared to come up here and worship God, all the talent in the world won't help anybody. I appreciate the talent, but I appreciate the heart in our musicians more than their talent. I appreciate that. Can you say amen? But, but that, that passion, passion is such an essential component to being a Christian. Can you remember a time when you had more passion than you do right now? Can you remember a time in, in, when you came to Christ and that he's all you wanted to talk about? You ever been about around a little teenage girl in love? She has a boyfriend that's, that's all she wants to talk about. And it's true of boys too. All they want to talk about is that girl. Why? They have a passion about it. They're excited about it. They're excited about this person they've met. They think they're in love. (laughs) Love the Lord with all your passion. And prayer and intelligence. I was up this morning, 543. I looked at the clock, got up, got out of bed, was awakened. Spent some time just praying for today that you'd have ears to hear what the Spirit would say, that you would be engaged in what the Lord wants to speak to us at this first of the year. Love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and intellect. This is the most important. Now notice this, the first on any list. But there is a second to set alongside it. Love others as well as you love yourself. 
These two commandments are pegs. Everything in God's law and the prophet hangs on them. Now, since God is so good, it's easy to love him. But some of us can be a pain in the neck. How many of you know sometimes it's easier to love God, whom you've not seen, than to love people you got to rub shoulders with every day? Isn't that true? But we'll never love those people that rub us the wrong way until we love God. Because when you love God, you see past what's going on in that person's life. When you love God, you have compassion for whatever it is. You know, sometimes people are really not mad at you. They're just mad. They're upset. Things aren't going well for them. They may take it out on you, but it's not you they're mad at. It's life. It's circumstances. It's situations. And sometimes we can react to that thinking that that's how they're feeling towards us when the truth is they might be feeling that way about themselves. They may be down on themselves. They may be disappointed in themselves. But when you see somebody through the eyes of God, you look past all their faults and you see their need. That's what loving God and loving people really will do for you. Until we discover that loving God is connected to loving people, we won't ever walk where we're supposed to walk or be involved in people's lives where we're supposed to be. I want you to go with me to 1 John chapter 4. John, of course, was the apostle of love. He was known as the apostle of love. And he said this in verses 20 and 21 in the Message Bible, 1 John 4, verse 20. If anyone boasts, I love God, and goes on hating his brother or sister, thinking nothing of it, this is a little strong, he's a liar. If he won't love the person he can see, How can he love the God he can't see? The command we have from Christ is blunt. Loving God includes loving people. You've got to love both. Praise God. So where do we actually start our love walk? Where does it actually start in our life? How do we practically take what the scriptures are saying and literally work in those? That's a very important question. And uh, the fruit of whether or not you love God begins at home. Can everybody say that? It begins at home. I've known people who are wonderful to people outside the home because they don't have rubbed shoulders with them. They just see them and go on. But they're not so nice to the people that live right beside them. Live in the same house, sleep in the same bed sometimes. That's a little more difficult because when you get down to the nitty-gritty of living, life can take on a different tenor, can it? Can it? See, I know some of you would have stayed home today if you knew I was going to be talking about love. You say, I wanted to make a New Year's resolution. I want to be in church the first Sunday of the new year, and that's all well and good. But you ought to have ears to hear what the Spirit of God is speaking to our church because if we'll hear what he's speaking, he's going to take us higher. I want somebody to say out loud, higher. Higher. That's good. Loving God is truly evidenced by how we love our family. I think it begins with husbands and wives and parents loving their children. Let me just read you this again from the message, 1 Peter chapter 3. That's where we'll begin. 1B begins like this. Be good wives to your husbands, responsive to their needs. I know you'd have stayed home now if you'd known we are going to talk about that. <laughs> hey, I, I chose the most modest Example I could. I didn't even read the King James. I went to the message so that, so that you can take it. Be good wives to your husbands, responsive to their needs. There are husbands who, indifferent as they are to about words of God, will be captivated by your life of holy beauty. What matters is not your outward appearance, the styling of your hair, the jewelry you wear, the cut of your clothes, but your inner disposition. Cultivate, notice this, inner beauty. Do you know some people spend all their time on the outside? We ought to be spending more time on the inside and let that reflect on the outside. Can you say amen? How many of you agree with that? No, 
cultivate inner beauty, the gentle, gracious kind that God delights in. The holy women of old were beautiful before God. That way, in that way, and were good. Loyal wives to their husbands. We should be loyal to our spouses. Notice verse 7. Now it's not going to leave the husbands out. Aren't you glad for that? The same goes for you husbands. Be good husbands to your wives. Honor them. Delight in them. As women, they lack some of your advantages. How many of you know that in the marketplace to this very day, it's true that they lack the advantage sometimes of a counterpart being a male? But notice what he says. But in the new life of God's grace, you're equals. You're not under your husband's foot. You walk alongside him. You shouldn't walk behind him, and you shouldn't walk in front of him. You should walk alongside him. That's what brings harmony and unity in a family is when two people walk together. Well, you're not, you're not shouting as good as I'm preaching right now. <laughs> Treat your wives then as equals. Now notice, so your prayers do not run aground. The King James says that they won't be hindered. Hindered doesn't mean they're stopped, but it means they're hindered. You've got some things you've got to work out before that prayer is going to be effective. Only now are we ready to love our neighbor, our coworker, the person beside us. But does loving your neighbor only, because friends and neighbors are important in our lives, but does it only mean the person next door? Jesus answered this question. I want us to go there. Today's a great word day. I want to start us off on the word. How many of you know it really doesn't matter anything else, but you could live your life by the word? Man shall not live by bread only. But by every word, every word, every word. Say that three times. Every word, every word, every word. Not just cherry picking it. Not just picking out the verses from your promise box that you love. But also read the conditions. How many of you know you get contracts that tell you that this house is going to be yours at the end of a certain amount of time, but it gives you conditions in the meantime. If you don't meet the conditions, the house isn't yours. So the promises of God aren't yours unless you meet the conditions. I'm not talking about works here in the sense of trying to earn everything by works, but I'm talking about being obedient to the Word of God, just living your life in accordance with the Bible, just by the Word. The word's a powerful thing. Can you say amen? Luke, in Luke 10, I want you to go there for a minute. You'll find an answer to this question that was posed to Jesus. It said, who is my neighbor? Luke 10, 25, Jesus said, or it says, just then a religious, religion scholar stood up with a question to test Jesus. Teacher, what did I need to do to get eternal life? He answered, what's written in God's law? How do you interpret it? He said. That you love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and muscle and intelligence, and that you love your neighbor as well as you do yourself? Good answer, said Jesus. Do it and you'll live. Now notice this. I love this in the message. It says, looking for a loophole. How many of you sometimes find yourself looking for a loophole? That's what I was doing that day. I asked the policeman that question. I'm going to really work on that in 2016, really work on it, especially after what happened to me. Looking for a loophole, he asked, and just how would you define neighbor? Jesus answered by telling a story. You know, there's one thing about Brother Hagin. I got to spend many hours with Brother Hagin over many years, and it didn't matter what you ask him. He'd never, ever, I mean, I don't ever remember him saying yes or no. I remember him telling you a story. He was a master storyteller. And this is what Jesus did. He said, there was once a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. On the way, he was attacked by robbers. They took his clothes, beat him up, and went off, leaving him half dead. Luckily, a priest was on his way down the same road, but when he saw him, he angled across to the other side. Have you ever done that? I remember just being a little boy, just a teenage kid. 
And I heard Sister Brookie. You've heard me talk about Sister Brookie. Sister Brookie walked in the Spirit. She loved God with all of her heart. So I was about six miles from my home up in a little town called Mantio, and I was in Farring's Drugstore. Remember it so well. And I heard Brookie's voice, and I went another way. Because I knew Brookie would know what I'd been doing the day before, and she would take me right there in the middle of everybody and pray for me. <laughs> he angled across to the other side. Then a Levite religious man showed up. He also avoided the injured man. A Samaritan traveling the road came on to him. When he saw the man's condition, his heart went out to him. He gave him first aid, disinfecting and bandaging his wounds. Then he lifted him onto his donkey, led him to an inn, and made him comfortable. In the morning... He got out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take good care of him. If it costs any more, put it on my bill. I'll pay you on my way back. What do you think? Which of the three became a neighbor to the man attacked by robbers? The one who treated him kindly? The religion scholar responded. Jesus said, Go and do the same. Recently, I saw this idea in action. I had gone to pick up my motorcycle that, had been, that I had had to bring in for a recall. And uh, the dealer was over in Winter Haven. And so I'd gone over to pick it up. I still had on my work clothes and, uh, and a pair of shoes, which you really shouldn't be riding with just that on anyhow. And uh, anyhow, th it had been recalled for a brake situation. And it's the only recall I've ever had on, on one of those bikes. And so, anyhow, I took it over to get it fixed, and I never thought anything about it. I just went and picked it up. I was on my way home, and I, I was on, uh, actually on Polk Parkway, going just a little above the speed limit, but within the legal limits. <laughs> and made it fine, and got off and came down, and was just about a half mile from my home, and it had just begun to sprinkle a little bit. And all of a sudden, I went to tap my brakes to go around that corner, and my brakes locked up on me. The very thing I had taken it in to make sure it didn't happen, happened. And my bike went out from under me, and I hit on the road. And I'm skidding down the highway, bike going one way, thank God it didn't fall on me, and me going another way. So I'm all skinned up and bleeding and, and disoriented. I, I, I tried to get up. I did get up just for a moment. Walked around a little bit, pulled my phone out. I still to this day don't know how I got my phone back. I just remember doing this, and I couldn't even remember how to call B. I was completely dazed. The next thing you know, I was flat of my back in the middle of the road with my helmet still on with somebody standing over me. Sir, can we help you? <laughs> I had become unconscious. And now woke up. Remember Christmas Eve? Saying Jesus was born in America? I was still dazed. Anyhow, they, they, were, they were wanting to know if they could call 911, call an ambulance for me. And I said no. And then the next thing I remember saying was, I don't want my wife to know. <laughs> I was just like a little kid out there afraid he's going to get in trouble. <laughs> and all of you know, at that point, there's probably five cars that had pulled off to try to help me. And they were so kind. All of these were neighbors, and they were, they were out there asking me, could they help me? Could they do this and that? And, and then I said that about, I don't want my wife to know. They chuckled a little bit at that. I remember that. But I was completely disoriented. I didn't, I knew where my house was, but I couldn't. I can't even remember the people that helped me, what they looked like. I, I had a bit of amnesia afterwards. Anyhow, I finally said, just please help me get my bike off the road. Again, I knew B had gone to Publix. And I was only, she's only about a mile from where I was. And I didn't want her to come upon me and find my bike sprawled out and me laying out in the highway. She would have panicked beyond words, and I knew it. And I'd never get to get back on my bike again. <laughs> so my neighbor took me 
They said, well, can we take you to your house? I said, yeah, I'll leave. I'll just we'll leave my bike here, and I'll get somebody to come help me with it later, and Josh did. And uh, anyhow, when I got to my gate, I hardly could remember my code to get in the gate. And so I'm out there, and I said to the lady, well, I just lived down the road. She says, we know who you are. <laughs> So they took me right to my house. I didn't even have to tell them. But then I got the sweetest note. I brought it to read to you from them. And this is what I'm talking about. I don't even know what these people profess as far as their beliefs. But here's a little note that came and dropped in my mailbox. I just wanted to check on you from the other night. This is S and J Brown. Gave me their address. We We gave you a ride home. We have been praying that you were fine. Hope you had a very Merry Christmas. Give us a call and let us know how you are doing. And I gave them a call, obviously sent them a little thank you. And, uh, but something touched me about their kindness. Not just them, all of them around there. They couldn't do enough. They, they, couldn't, they couldn't have been kinder. And uh, I'm, I was already planning to go along these lines for the new year because the Lord had already been dealing with me. He starts early with you. And after all that was over, I was going to tell that story New Year's Eve. And I just felt like, no, hold it for Sunday. It fits what you're going to be talking about. So that's why I waited until today. But you know what? I, my first thought when they were trying to get me to call an ambulance was, number one, I didn't want B to come, find my bike in that shape, and somebody say they took him to the hospital. And then I thought, well, if I go to the hospital, I know I've got something wrong here. It was a concussion. I I won't be able to go do Christmas Eve. And I'd have been better off not doing Christmas Eve if I've got Jesus being born in America. But I read most of my message, stayed real close to my notes. And uh, I don't think many people were the wiser other than Jesus being born in America. That would be it. That would be the tell-all. But no, here's what I want to close with today. It's the idea that in life we get lots of opportunities. We can be like the priest who goes on by or the other person who was too busy But we need to be like the man that stopped and bound up the man's wounds and took him somewhere to help him and bless him. I want to be more sensitive to the needs of people around me. When I have something they need that I can help them with, I want to be willing to do that. When I see that what somebody needs is something spiritual, I want to be willing to talk to them because Jesus said, compel them to come to my house. I want to be the type of Christian that says, look, I know what will be a blessing to you. I'd like to come pick you up and take you to church with me, and you either can come home and eat with me after church, or I'll take you to a restaurant and feed you. If at some point the church becomes the church, and we start walking in the love of God, we will have more miracles than we know what to do with. We're wanting everything to happen in the church, but the greater miracles happen outside of the church. When I was in the piano and organ business, I was always ministering to people. I was. I mean, where I do now, I'm, 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 it's a little different. I'm not out in, in outside as much. I'm doing church work in the house of the Lord. But I want to encourage you because most of you aren't preachers. Most of you aren't up here doing this. But every day you have an opportunity to share the gospel in word, action, or deed. And I believe that that's what the Lord is saying. If you want miracles, be more conscious of others. Love God first and then love each other. And when you do that, life will turn for you in a new direction, a totally separate direction, and you'll start seeing the miracles of God. Will you receive that today? How many of you believe that that's right on for the new year? I believe that is the secret to our lives. Would you stand to your feet?